your heart out, okay, go. Oh. Oh, hey there, nerds. Uh, I've got your highly detailed results right here. And my name is Dr. Jordan of the house breeding, first of his name, the unwashed, king of the sandals and the okay chin, king of screens, call of one great ass PP protector of myself, regent apologist of the lucky number Slevin, breaker of dances, and father of one kid so cute she'll make your eyes fall out, but please, call me Jordan. When you're on a roll, you're on a roll. You're watching another deeply intricate episode of Your Brain on Crack, the show where people keep telling me movies don't have to be as logical as I seem to want them to be, and the only show on Cracked edited by physically cutting and splicing 35 millimeter film. Today, I diagnose. <laughs> Alright, let's face it. If I was in a movie, most of my plans wouldn't get any further than pooping my pants and begging for mercy. And that's why I'm always the first to praise movie characters when they actually come up with a solid, elaborate plan that does not end with a wet face and or diaper. But that said, sometimes these movie schemes are way longer, way more convoluted than they ever should logically be. <laughs> The elders in M. Night Shyamalan's The Village one day so had it with 70s disco and mustachioed porn stars that they just up and leave civilization behind to start a new community in the woods. <laughs> they get rid of all present day technology and pretend that their new settlement exists in the 1800s and to ensure that their children are never seduced by the outside world and its Harry Potter books and meth-fueled orgies and meth-fueled Harry Potter themed orgies, the parents take turns pretending to be freaky monsters who attack anybody who tries to leave. Sometimes we don't do things we want to do so that others won't know we want to do them. Eventually, one of the kids stabs another kid out of horn dog jealousy, and the only way the wounded teenager will survive is with modern medicine. But of course, anybody who ventures into the modern world to grab some penicillin will inevitably see a bojangles and refuse to return to their life of chewy venison and grass pies. The ceremony of meat. The elders solve this problem by sending a blind girl because she can nab the medicine without ever being in danger of seeing any horseless carriages whizzing by or a trailer for a movie. Ah. Remember when we used to have those? It is too painful, I cannot bear it! But uh, shockingly, sending a random blind girl into the woods to scrounge for Advil isn't quite as foolproof as you'd think. To start, the dudes tasked with accompanying her immediately abandon her because they're terrified of the monsters nobody told them were fake. It is only farce. So when the jealous guy shows up to stop her, she just has to outrun him and hope she doesn't get stabbed or fall in a hole, which is sort of tough because, you know, the, the eyes don't, they don't work good. Except literally any of the elders could have grabbed a walking stick and gotten the medicine themselves. They know the monsters aren't real. The one the girl deals with is just a mentally ill Adrian Brody trying to have sex with her. He wouldn't try that on his parents. Probably. There are different types of love. Also, the elders know the layout of the forest and aren't, and this is super crucial, blind. <gasps> And you know what was the worst chance of being seduced by the sultry sounds of 2004 and all of its chart-topping Black Eyed Peas album? Someone who hasn't had an erection since the Nixon administration. I'm Bar. guilty, Robert! Minority Report is a story about pumping sad children full of drugs until they can see the future. Might as well be called Elon Musk's Basement, the movie. <laughs> By the time the movie starts, the pre-crime program is still in beta, and the three pre-cogs only predict future murders in the greater Washington, D.C. area, while floating in kiddie pools full of pre uh, something. Thanks to the kids' horrific, unceasing nightmares, nobody has been murdered in years, and everything seems to be going great for everybody except, I guess, the drug children. But all that changes when Tom Cruise's character is accused of murdering some dude he's never met before, and he determines to find out if these coked out vampires ever get a prediction wrong. Answer my question. During his quest, Cruz learns of the murder of a woman named Anne Lively from years earlier. The police had captured her initial attempted murderer, but as it turns out, there was a second killer who arrived only moments after the first and murdered her in an identical pattern to the original would-be killer. They were so similar, the police thought the precogs were having echoes and just threw out the second murder vision. Except, twist! It turns out that the second murderer was the director of pre-crime, and the woman was a precog's mom that wanted her kid back, so the director devised this sneaky way to kill her before she ruined his program. <laughs> what he did brilliantly exploited the system, at least until he messed with Tom Cruise, and as we all know, you should never mess with Cruises, especially during a pandemic. However, there is one way he could have avoided the Cruise entirely. <laughs> Again, the precog program literally only works in Washington, D.C. If the director had attempted to murder her literally anywhere else, 
They could have gotten away with it. Precogs couldn't predict a drowning occurring at, say, Camden Yards and, I don't know, the third urinal stall from the right and something like the club section bathroom, just as an example. At the end of the movie, the precogs are given a happy life of not dreaming about murder by getting dumped way out in the middle of nowhere away from people and their salacious thoughts. Their range is limited such that he could have grabbed her, driven outside the city limits, and I mean, you know, murder her or whatever. I know it sounds like I know a lot about murdering people, but I promise things have changed a lot since I was actively studying this stuff. Well, let's say that I did spend an awful lot of time in the prison library. The director of pre-crime surely knew the precognitive range of his little future seekers, but still devised this insane scheme which ultimately leaves behind an abundance of evidence and, ironically, a whole bunch of murders. Oh my gosh, are you okay? <laughs> The emotional turning point of Fast and Furious is the brutal, but also soon to be retconned murder of Dom's main girl, Letty. Dom had recently left his girlfriend to protect her from crime, I guess. And to the surprise of exactly nobody, Letty, an insanely talented street racer and highly competent criminal, forgoes getting a barista job and immediately turns to the life of crime she'd never left to support herself without Dom and his improbably thick neck. Shut up! Letty goes all in on the crime, skipping over growing her own pot or smuggling fidget spinners and diving straight into the heroin trade. 20% angel, 80% devil. Her boss's recruitment plan is to hold street races and offer spots on his heroin running team to the winners, and Letty of course wins the tryout race, but what she doesn't know is that the drug lord, Braga, only has his drivers run heroin a couple of times before capping them in the head, ensuring the location of his secret tunnel route never leaks. It's the perfect crime. Except, this plan requires Braga to host a massive street race every couple of weeks with enough attention to attract drivers talented enough to pull off the precise driving required to navigate his route. Go. But doesn't anybody notice that the winners of these races disappear a few weeks after their win? Surely word gets around. These are some of the best and most notorious drivers in the world. And at this point, Letty herself has already been involved in several major heists that warranted FBI attention. And the series makes very clear that Dom's gang are almost supernaturally gifted room rumors. So how long is it before Braga exhausts his supply of competent drivers? After a few runs, he's gonna be recruiting from the delivery team at the local Jimmy John's. Now that's what I call real driver. Now that's bullshit. Just pay them well or something. They're professional criminals. Stop micromanaging them and let them do their job. I'm tired of all these disrespectful bosses who don't trust me to run heroin without flipping. I know rat. <laughs> The Prestige follows the epic, bitter rivalry between two grown-up, this is literally their only job magicians, Robert Angier and Alfred Borden. After a few years of screwing with each other's acts, Borden comes out with a new trick called the Transported Man, wherein he seemingly transports from one side of the room to the other instantaneously. Angier cannot figure out how Borden pulls this off, but he makes it his mission to one day come up with a better version. According to The Prestige, a magician's life is like one-third tricks, maybe two-thirds overwhelming obsession and vengeance, and then maybe just a little rubber ball play thrown in. And then I'll be gone. Fortunately, Angier meets Nikola Tesla, who just happens to have built a big-ass cloning machine in the 1890s. <laughs> Angier uses this ex machina at every gig, duplicating himself and killing the most recent original Angier via trap door, drowning his former self in a water tank under the stage. Angier then lugs his drowned clones to a big warehouse for safekeeping, or maybe just to look at them and talk about his day, I guess. Thankfully, each new clone has all of Angier's memories, along with his penchant for card tricks and his winning Hugh Jackman-y smile, so it's almost like he never drowned horribly at all. But at what point does Angier realize he doesn't need to keep duplicating himself and just use the same duplicate over and over? It's got his memories and stuff, so it wouldn't take too much convincing to get his clone to participate in this very simple plan. After all, Angier consistently chooses magic over anything else in his life. It'll take two seconds before his clone would say, Oh, not just lots of fame, but lots and lots of fame? And I don't have to drown? Well, consider me it, me. <laughs> when he learns that Borden's version of the trick utilizes his twin brother, AKA nature's all natural clones, it blows Angier's magical mind. I just don't know. You don't know? Why has Angier never considered that? Hell, he could make three or four clones and do an even crazier transportation trick with him showing up under people's seats and beside them at the third urinal stall from the right. Of course, Angier would never consider this. He's the kind of magician that would surgically graft a coin to the back of your skull just so he could pry it from behind your ear. Oh, 
Alrighty, discuss the timeless sex appeal of the Black Eyed Peas, mention Christian Bale's rubber balls, confirm that I am indeed not a rat. I think that's it. Be sure to talk to Kathy on your way out to pick up some drugs for your will I am fetish. <laughs> Good luck with that. Hey guys, um, thanks for watching that video. I really appreciate you watching it. We're hoping to make a whole lot of these. Um, so <laughs> if, uh, if you could hit the subscribe button, if you could uh, maybe just ding the little bell so that you get the notifications when we put out new videos, um, I promise we'll make them funny, we'll make them good. <laughs> Please do it. <laughs>